Okay, uh, let's start the afternoon session. First speaker is Ji Wei Yun, who will speak about irregular training things on this program. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a talk here. My great honor. Uh, uh, so, uh, at least for me personally, it's quite educational, this whole uh, process of uh, preparing for the talk. I, I read uh, some stories about Emmy Noether. And before, uh, Noether is, is basically a mathematical notation for me. I, when I read about a, a Noetherian ring, I never have a clear picture of uh, Emmy Noether as a person. Uh, now I, I know some of her stories. And, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it feels uh, um, just as a usual human being, uh, the, uh, well, this was an unusual um, mathematician. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about today is in a similar spirit as um, uh, the inverse Galois problem to which uh, Emmy Noether made her uh, fundamental contribution. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about a solution to a particular case of the, the, the Lean Simpson problem. Uh, this is joint work with Constantine Jaco. Well, with, with uh, Pierre's permission, I'm going to talk about what the Lin Simpson problem is, uh, <laughs> at least my understanding. Uh, okay, so at the very concrete and elementary level, uh, we can think of it as a, a solving matrix equations. Suppose I have a fixed uh, a, a number of conjugacy classes. And by invertible matrices, <clears throat> I ask whether we can solve the following equation, A1 times A2 times AR equals identity, where AI is MCR. Okay, so I want the ith matrix to be in a specific conjugacy class. For example, I fix the eigenvalues and the Jordan type. Uh, the only condition is that the, their product has to be the identity matrix. Um, this, you can interpret this problem geometrically as uh, trying to find a local system on let's say a uh, punctured, uh, punctured plane complex plane with the uh, uh, R minus one, uh, R minus one, yeah. Uh, C minus, uh, or maybe, maybe just, uh, you want to remove R points. And these, uh, <coughs> ah, sorry. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, if, if R is two, I want, it's basically just the information of one matrix and that's the monodromy around puncture. So it's P1 minus two points. Uh, okay, okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, so these CIs prescribed the monodromies up to conjugacy uh, um, around each puncture, including the puncture at infinity. Uh, and then, uh, well, we, we start with some common base point and then this equation is, is necessary and a sufficient condition for the existence of a local system on this uh, P1 minus R points with prescribed local monodromy. So here's a simple example where such an equation is not solvable. Uh, 
uh, let's take C1 uh, to be the conjugacy class of let's say one, one, something. So semi-simple conjugacy class with two eigenvalues equal to one. C2 contains a similar matrix. Again, it has two eigenvalues, one. Um, and then C3, let's just take uh, any uh, conjugacy class that does not have eigenvalue one. Then I claim uh, it's impossible to find matrices with, within these three conjugacy classes whose product is equal to one. Um, maybe this will be a fun exercise for everybody to think about. Um, what we are interested in today is um, a variant of this problem with deeper ramification. So this problem can be formulated uh, in terms of uh, vector bundles with connections. So we have this uh, <clears throat> uh, local systems, the, the Riemann-Hilbert uh, correspondence that gives uh, uh, a bijection between local systems on uh, a Riemann surface, uh, C. Well, so, so uh, open, uh, well, by Riemann surface, I mean uh, algebraic curve with several points removed. And uh, on the other hand, we can consider uh, vector bundles with connection of C. So, uh, <clears throat> algebraic vector bundles with the uh, algebraic connection on C uh, with the um, regular singularities uh, at the punctures. So they're in by bijection. <clears throat> so we can think of this problem as the uh, asking for the existence of vector bundles with connections with specific uh, behavior at, uh, around the punctures. So basically uh, the data of these uh, local monodromy uh, conjugacy classes will translate to uh, the residue uh, at these uh, punctures uh, of, the, of the connection matrix. Now, uh, the irregular Berlin-Simpson problem uh, we allow connections with uh, uh, with uh, irregular singularities. So let me. <coughs> oh, Let me uh, quickly review the notion of irregular connections um, on the on around the puncture or on a puncture disk. So this is a puncture disk with local coordinate z. You can write connection matrix. Uh, so its connection can always be written uh, locally as a connection matrix, AZ. And <clears throat> um, so let's just recall a regular singularity at z equals zero, it means, means um, you can find a <clears throat> um, trivial, local trivialization of your vector bundle such that this, uh, this A, Z does not have a pole. A is uh, holomorphic. If it, if you, um, <clears throat> if it does have a pole, then um, 
is called irregular. But we can introduce a more a numerical invariant that characterizes how irregular this connection is. So this uh, we call the following uh, structure result, um, which I, I learned from uh, Nick's uh, Professor Katz paper. Uh, so that, um, for any connection, uh, irregular or regular, you can find a cyclic cover. So, um, so uh, this is uh, T goes to cyclic M, cyclic Mth cover such that if you pull back the connection by this cover, it, its irregular part becomes diagonal. So this can be written as D plus, um, let's call it A, uh, uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately I also use D for the leading term. Um, where uh, AD, AD minus one up to T minus one. So all the polar terms um, are diagonal matrices. Can simultaneously diagonalize the irregular part of the connection as long as you pass to a certain uh, ramified cover of the formal disk. Uh, and the, the, the leading order uh, D is called the slope. It's the, um, well, when, when AD is non zero, uh, D is called the slope, or the largest, largest slope um, of, uh, of this connection. So we are interested in following kind of uh, connection that, that, that we call isoclinic. Namely, uh, all the slopes are the same. So this, is, this refers to connections such that if you make such a base change, the leading term um, is, uh, the leading term is regular semi-simple. So it's diagonal with distinct eigenvalues. We're talking about rank n connections. Okay, and uh, so sorry. Uh, uh, I should uh, okay. Oh, so yeah. So this um, isoclinic refers not to the standard representation of GLN, but to the adjoint representation. It's, uh, if you take the associated vector bundle for the adjoint representation, it should still, uh, all the non-zero slopes should, should all be the same. So that, that's what I, yeah. So that notion generalizes to other Lie groups. Thank you for the question. Uh, oh, so here I should correct. So the slope uh, should really be D over M. Okay, and then, then this number, this rational number will be independent of how you make the base change. <clears throat> so we have the, the notion of isoclinic conne connection of slope D over M. This means connection such that if you make an Mth base change, the leading term is regular semi-simple. Uh, and this definition has a generalization to other lead types. <clears throat> so if I, instead of GLN, I work with a uh, connected redu reductive group over C. <clears throat> and 
locally <coughs> a G connection, again, can be represented by a connection matrix. This time it's a G valued uh, function. Aeromorphic function. And again, when, when this AZ is holomorphic, we call it a regular singular. Otherwise we call it irregular. There's an analog of this structure result. Uh, when you pass to a cyclic covering, you can simultaneously put the irregular terms in the connection into a fixed Cartan subalgebra. <clears throat> um, and then we make the following definition that this connection is called isoclinic uh, uh, of slope D over M. But basically we just copy that definition. Um, so make a degree M cyclic covering uh, base change. The connection matrix becomes uh, simultaneously <clears throat> or the negative terms are in uh, a fixed Cartan subalgebra and the leading term is a uh, regular semi-simple. Okay, so now I can formulate exactly what kind of a, a, a the Lean Simpson problem we are trying to solve. So we are in the general setup of a reductive connected reductive group G. And we are interested in uh, connections, G connections on P1 minus two points. So it has sing possibly singularities at zero and infinity. And we require at infinity, this connection um, is isoclinic of slope of some slope, mu d over m, <coughs> some rational number, positive that rational number. <clears throat> and at zero, I ask this uh, connection to be regular, uh, has regular singularities, and I <clears throat> prescribe its uh, residue. In some adjoint orbit. <clears throat> okay, so this O is a uh, adjoint orbit. Okay, so I'm interested in such connections. And uh, the question is whether such connection exists if I give you the slope and the, the adjoint orbit. Simpson problem for new and O. So this, this is um, yes or no. If so, yes, if uh, such a connection uh, exists. Okay, so, so I think. Hopefully, this is a well formulated question. Uh, the only input data we have <clears throat> is a rational, positive rational number and an adjoint orbit. <clears throat> um, okay, so maybe I'll just give an example, uh, sort, of, sort of easy cases of this question. <clears throat> um, it turns out if, um, <clears throat> 
if the slope is at least one, then uh, for then the, the, the question always has an affirmative answer. So this is always yes for all adjoint orbits O. <coughs> Um, basically, you can just write it down. So you can um, um, <clears throat> you can start with this connection matrix. Um, so A is a constant uh, matrix in O. <clears throat> it just uh, doesn't involve Z. So this would have the correct. Oh, sorry, dz over, over z. So this would have the, um, uh, a times, this would have the co correct uh, residue. Um, Yeah, so I would like to say I want to add, so this, this term, since this term will, um, uh, use here, dz No, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just forgot whether there was a elementary explanation for this. But I'm sure this, the statement is correct. If the slope is at least one, you can, <clears throat> um, you can, you can have any, you can uh, prescribe, prescribe any uh, residue, uh, adjoint, adjoint orbit. Um, well, for, for, for example, the zero, uh, so e, if O is the zero, Orbit. This, in some sense, is the hardest to, uh, case to achieve. Uh, then you can. Um, um, okay, maybe just a specific example. The slope is one. Then you can uh, write down. The, then, then this formula uh, gives a connection. So if A is a regular semi-simple element in G. At infinity, it. If you write uh, using local coordinate at infinity, this becomes uh, d. So if I do zeta is d inverse, this is d zeta over zeta square. So you have a second order pole that gives a irregular uh, that gives slope one at infinity. And the leading term is regular semi-simple, and there's no other singularity. So that's a, a simplest example. That's slope one. Uh, in, in general, general principle is the smaller this adjoint orbit is, the harder to, um, to, to make such connections. <clears throat> so another extreme is if O is, so all these are not completely obvious facts, but they, they follow from the main result. If O is a regular adjoint orbit, so this means uh, the um, centralizer centralizer has dimension equal to the rank of G. Then uh, this, for any new, for any slope, the answer is yes. So this O can be regular semi-simple or a regular uh, nilpotent orbit in either case or something in between, but then it, it works for any slope. Okay, so let me mention the um, <clears throat> previous work on this <clears throat> problem, which motivated our work.
when we are talking about usual connections, just rank n uh, vector bundle, um, <clears throat> just my slide reference. <clears throat> For rank n vector bundles, uh, this problem is solved. So it's with GLN. It's completely solved by uh, work of uh, uh, Paul Carney. Let's say Western and uh, uh, five authors. Daniel Sage from uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so our goal is to uh, solve this problem for general G, general slope and, and adjoint orbit. But maybe let me describe their result, which is a very, <coughs> it has a um, very beautiful answer. So first, um, this slope cannot be arbitrary, regardless of uh, uh, what adjoint orbit that you match at zero. Just look at the existence of local connection. It already puts very strong constraints on the possible slope. So the slope can, in the case of a rank N connections, the slope can only be uh, two kinds. Either the denominator is exactly N or N minus one. So in, in lowest terms, uh, rational numbers, denominator is either n or n minus one. And uh, uh, so, so, so actually uh, they only consider the first case, uh, but so uh, let, let me just restrict to that case. So if mu is d over n, d is co-prime to n, what kind of <coughs> orbit uh, O can we match uh, the other singularity. So O um, uh, yeah, so the condition, so let, let's just to state a simpler version, let's assume O is neopotent. Then the condition for the Deline Simpson problem to be yes is that if you look at the Jordan, Jordan type, this is a partition of N recording the Jordan length of Jordan blocks of O. And uh, the condition is that Lambda has uh, at most D parts. <clears throat> so an extreme example, when D is one, one over N, it says, lamb, the, it says lambda has at most one part, which forces O to be a regular neopotent orbit. And that, in that case, um, uh, this is uh, the famous uh, Klusterman connection studied by Professor Katz and Deline. Um, and at the other extreme, if I take D to be uh, bigger than N, then this is an empty condition. So any, you can put any neopotent orbit at zero, there will always be a connection with these local behavior. Okay, so this is the kind of result that we try to generalize to other groups. So first, um, there, is, there is this local constraint that the slope cannot be an arbitrary rational number if we are talking about isoclinic connections. So let me, say precisely what kind of rational numbers are allowed.
So it turns out the condition is on the denominator of mu. Um, so write mu in lowest terms as d over m. Then m must be uh, the order of a regular element in the wild group. So, so first, this wild group is the wild group of G. The notion of a regular element was introduced by Springer. So an element W in W is called a regular. If when we look at the, the standard reflection representation of W on Cartan, W, small w has an eigenvector that is not lying on any root wall. There exists an eigenvector V in the Cartan for uh, a regular semi-simple element in Cartan for, for a small w. Okay. So, so that's the notion of a regular element in the while group. So uh, if we look at while group of type A, namely SN, we will see um, two two classes of possible denominators to uh, uh, order M. So example, if the wild group is SN, then only a, a permutation is regular if and only if well, either uh, all cycles of W have the same length. Namely, uh, this W is a power of a cyclic permutation of length N. Or uh, almost all cycles have the same length except for a fixed point. Okay, so the first case is a power of cyclic permutation of length n. The second case is a power of cyclic permutation of length n minus one. <clears throat> um, I, I actually, I, I should correct here. So when I said in GLN, the allowed slopes are d over n, d over n minus one in lowest terms, I shouldn't say lowest terms. So, um, it is allowed that the D and N are not co-prime. Uh, the only con really condition here is that the denominator divides N or divides N minus one. These, these allowed denominators are exactly the order of regular elements in SN. Okay, so we get allowed denominators. of the slope are divisors of n, uh, and divisors of n. Um, at the other extreme, if we look at uh, an exceptional group, for example, E8, um, there are, there are um, 12 possibilities of these uh, denominators. Starting from the largest, you, you, the largest possible denominator is always the Coxter number. 
of your root system. It's 30 in the E8 case, 24, 20. So, um, so if you have 30, then all divisors of 30 are certainly also in the list. Uh, so really the generating elements here are the, the, um, the essential ones. Okay, so this gives a, a the local constraint. We, in the following, we only consider slopes whose denominator M is the, the order of some regular element in, in a while group. Okay. Now I'll try to state the result. <clears throat> So I'll state three, three answers to the, the Lin Simpson problem in this situation. So um, the first will give an algebraic criterion uh, in terms of in terms of uh, representation theory of a certain non-commutative algebra. Uh, the um, usefulness of this criterion is that it's, uh, there, are, there are algorithms to, to compute them and, and to effectively decide whether the answer is yes or no. Right. It in principle lead, leads to complete solution uh, algorithmically. And then uh, I can state a geometric criterion. This will be in terms of uh, cohomology, uh, well, not cohomology, in terms of the geometry of certain uh, affine Springer fibers. And this is the kind of geometry that enters into the problem. And finally, when G is a classical group, we just solve the problem in the most explicit way. So we give a complete solution uh, in terms of, uh, in, in, in the same style of GLM. So given a slope, we, give precise conditions on the Jordan types of the uh, adjoint orbit O such that the Lin Simpson problem has a solution. Um, so these are <coughs> different uh, solutions involve different um, <coughs> techniques. Uh, so let me uh, first uh, state the algebraic solution. So to state it, um, uh, to make the uh, statement simpler, I will restrict to the case where M is so-called elliptic regular. This is, uh, recall the notion of a regular element uh, as some element in W. Uh, in fact, it only, just uh, only the conjugacy class matters. Uh, elliptic regular means the element is elliptic. So M is the order of some W where W is elliptic and regular. Elliptic means um, 
elliptic means uh, it has no fixed point, uh, non-zero fixed point uh, on Cartan. So this restriction is not essential. The general non-elliptic cases can be reduced to the elliptic case. Uh, and if you look at the list of M's in E8, all of them are elliptic. For, for SN, the elliptic ones are, um, well, it, it, the elliptic one is, is just um, N itself. So only among all these regular numbers, only uh, M equals N is elliptic. So now uh, I'm going to introduce uh, some non-commutative algebra called uh, rational Pradic algebra. So I'm not gonna give the full definition, but just to give the flavor of what kind of object this is. Uh, another name of it maybe is more subject uh, suggestive is a double affine. It's a, a version of double affine Heck algebra. Uh, so roughly speaking, it's um, a deformation or degeneration of a semi-direct product of um, a wild group, semi-direct with the, um, a lattice, the kind of, let's say the root lattice, and it's dual. Take the group algebra of this semi-direct kind of double affine wild group and uh, uh, basically perform the way you turn a wild group into heck algebra, uh, you, you get this double affine heck algebra. So let's call, uh, give it a name, uh, HW. <coughs> Uh, maybe it's more fancy H because it's doubled. Okay, so yeah, so these rational Schrandic algebras have a quite rigid representation theory. Um, There's a, its representation theory is similar to represent, uh, is, is, is similar to uh, the Lie, representations of Lie algebra itself. Uh, you can think of this presentation as some kind of triangular decomposition where this, these parts correspond to strictly upper and lower triangular matrices. And this is analogous to the Cartan. Um, in particular, there, there are analogs of Verma modules. Um, there is a particular irreducible module of this um, uh, rational Schrandic algebra that's usually denoted L nu of triv. So here, this nu is a rational number. And in our setting, we are using precisely the slope of the connection, uh, the, the same new that we put here. So this is uh, some kind of central character. There's a central element in this algebra, and we ask that to act uh, by the scalar new. And the bracket triv is uh, emphasizing that um, it's, it's kind of highest weight analog of highest weight. So this simple module is a quotient of uh, an analog of Verma module, which is uh, induced from uh, the upper triangular part of the algebra, the trivial module uh, of the upper triangular part, and then you induce up to the whole thing. So this is a uh, analog of Verma module. So in any case, there's, there's this, uh, uh, distinguished simple module of this algebra. And uh, this will be a finite dimensional uh, if and only if 
uh, denominator of mu is, a reg is an elliptic regular number. But this is precisely the kind of denominator that we allow. Okay. On the other hand, <coughs> um, let's consider the other piece of uh, input data, which is an adjoint orbit. If this adjoint orbit is a nilpotent orbit, I can assign to it by the Springer correspondence an irreducible representation of the wild group. So from O, I get an irreducible representation of the wild group. From the slope, I get an irreducible representation of some mysterious non-commutative algebra. But in particular, this guy is also a representation of the wild group. So um, <clears throat> this is, I can forget about these complicated um, extra stuff in the in this rational Schrandic algebra, just let the wild group act. Okay, so now I can state <clears throat> theorem. Uh, again, this, the assumption is that mu uh, is uh, elliptic. It has elliptic regular uh, denominator and O is a nilpotent orbit. Then <clears throat> the Berlin Simpson problem has an affirmative solution if and only if, if we uh, view this irreducible module just as a wild group module. It contains this E of O. Okay, so I've used both, both input uh, data. Mu appears here and uh, the adjoint orbit appears here. And it's the representation theory of the wild group that connects both to give the criterion. Um, so, so this is the, I'm assuming here O is nilpotent, but the general case is, is just a slight variant. Um, um, just quickly say uh, general O. Uh, there's a very simple procedure to produce a nilpotent orbit out of an arbitrary adjoint orbit. Namely, you let your orbit flow under the scaling action. So start with any adjoint orbit. I can just scale my elements. It's going to produce a family of adjoint orbits. And I take the closure, <coughs> then intersect with the nilpotent cone. This is going to be uh, a closure of some nilpotent, unique nilpotent orbit. So this procedure, starting from arbitrary adjoint orbit, produces a nilpotent orbit. You start with a regular one, you, you end up with a regular one. Um, and then you just, uh, in theorem one, you start with arbitrary adjoint orbit. In the criterion, you only need to replace E of O by E of O nil. So that, that's the only modification you need to make. So, yeah, so, so this, uh, um, if, if you don't, uh, haven't worked with rational schrandic algebras, you may not, think this is very useful, but experts in that field has all kinds of methods uh, um, or algorithms to compute uh, this module as a w, w representation. So in principle, you can <clears throat> ask a computer to do the computation and uh, get the answer for any specific pair, mu and O. 
Okay, so that's the. Algebraic criterion. Um, may, maybe uh, in the interest of time, I, I'll skip the geometric criterion. I hopefully I'll be able to say a few words about it when I describe the proof idea. So let me just jump to um, um, theorem about. Uh, explicit solutions in the classical types of the complete solutions classical types um, I mean the the statement is in terms of uh, is in the form of a table uh, I'm not going to reproduce the table on the board I'll just give an, give the flavor of uh, Mm. Sorry, um, I messed up the order of the paper. Oh, okay, okay. Oh. Uh, I I talked about the type A case as the result of uh, uh, five authors. Uh, let's, okay, just give, give the type B case. So G is SO, 2M plus one. First of all, uh, what are the allowable uh, denominators? So this M, the condition is the M is a divisor of 2M. <clears throat> okay, uh, then the statement, um, uh, maybe before passing to this case, I, I there's a general phenomenon is that, sorry, here, for any new uh, is allowed, allowable, there exists a unique uh, nilpotent orbit. Determined just by the slope such that the Lin Simpson problem for the pair of mu and any adjoint orbit has affirmative answer if and only if this um, closure of your adjoint orbit under the scaling action contains uh, this O nu. So this O nu is uh, precisely the smallest adjoint orbit that you can achieve uh, if you want the, the Lin Simpson problem to have a, an affirmative answer. So there's always a unique minimal nilpotent orbit that makes the answer yes. And the complete solution is just a, a table of such um, correspondence, nu going to the orbit O nu. Uh, just to give you a flavor of the answer, if G is SO2M plus one, um, then uh, there are three cases. Um, so two and new, so new, new is always B over M, where M, the allowable Ms are divisors of two N. So 2n times nu will be an integer. If it's odd, then um, the Jordan type uh, has Jordan type has uh, uh, I call it lambda 2n plus one 2n u. Okay, so so this is a partition of two n plus one, with two two n new parts, and this is the unique partition with that many parts that's most balanced. So the size of the parts differ by at most one. So this is the most balanced. Um, and if two n new. Uh, is even, 
and, and D is bigger than one, uh, you have something similar to an, some balanced uh, partition with at most th these many parts uh, together with a singleton uh, Jordan block. And, and there, there are third case, maybe too complicated to, uh, some explicit partition that you can write down. <clears throat> Yeah, so in, in this sense, we have complete answers for all classical types. Uh, okay, so maybe I can say in five minutes, what, what, is the, what are the ideas that go into the proof? Especially um, how I find Springer fiber enter into the picture. <clears throat> so uh, roughly speaking, uh, we consider the moduli space. Uh, well, um, let, let's just call it M of mu. So this is a moduli space of G connections. With the condition that um, um, you know the, the same conditions that we impose at zero and infinity, as a clinic of slope nu at infinity, and at zero I just require it to be regular, not not fixing the residue. <clears throat> So there's some moduli space. And uh, this moduli space uh, in general philosophy, again, um, <coughs> advertised by Deleen and Simpson, uh, it, we should consider <coughs> a family of moduli spaces over A1, where the fiber over one is the moduli space of connections and uh, special fiber over zero is similar moduli space, uh, but for Higgs bundles instead of connections. It's some linearized version of connections. And the geometry of this moduli space is better understood. In particular, this space, uh, contains uh, a certain affine spring or fiber. Oh, um, in, in fact, what's more relevant for us is that there is a C star action <clears throat> everywhere in the diagram. So in, on the base, there's a C star action. Um, it contracts every fiber to the central fiber. Moreover, within the central fiber, Uh, the whole thing contracts to a, a, a smaller part of it, which is isomorphic to an affine Springer fiber. So the Lin Simpson problem is about the existence of a point uh, here with a specific residue. So there's, a, there's a, another residue map that goes to adjoint portions, uh, G mod G. And nice thing about the situation is this map is smooth. <clears throat> um, and just using some elementary algebraic geometry of the situation, uh, there exists a point with prescribed residue if and only if after taking the limit, you can find a point in this affine spring or fiber with a property that reflects that it came from a certain prescribe the residue. So here there's a there is a some uh, structure analogous to taking the residue and uh, you the condition is that residue in, in this limit uh, in on the, on the affine springer fiber has to lie in the closure of the original residue. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so that at least hopefully gives you a flavor of how this kind of geometry enter into the proof. And now uh, in my thesis, I studied uh, 
the relation. So uh, I connected affine Springer fibers with um, uh, rational, uh, various kinds of double affine Heck algebras. So let's say, in particular, rational Schrödinger algebra. They are they these algebras act on the cohomology of affine Springer fibers, and once we reduced the problem to finding to, to showing certain um, sub variety of affine spring fiber is non empty you can detect that sub variety uh, as part of the cohomology where the wild group acts in a certain way so that after that translation you get the algebraic criterion in terms of the rational schrandic algebra um, now this theorem too involves a different in, in addition to this involves a Another idea, uh, which is um, uh, something very explicit, but um, I don't completely understand it. Um, so I'll just say what, what kind of geometry is involved. If we look at um, affine uh, Grassmannian, sorry for not giving any context here. Affine Springer fibers are fixed points of certain vector fields on the affine Grassmann. Now, instead of, instead of taking a single vector field, let's just take a, a whole Cartan, uh, um, the loop group of a, of a Cartan subgroup of a, of, a, um, of a maximal torus in the loop group. Uh, and I need to you know, uh, restrict to the mm, neutral component. And the question is uh, uh, to compute its fixed points. So you can view this as a intersection of uh, many, many different affine Springer fibers. You get something smaller than affine Springer fiber, which turns out to be sufficient to answer the Billing Simpson problem. So um, as long as anytime you can say any, you can compute such fixed points explicitly, you get an explicit answer to the Delin Simpson problem. So that's what we did for classical groups, but uh, I don't know how to <clears throat> describe these fixed points for exceptional groups. Uh, I should stop here. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Are any of these connections rigid? Ah, okay, that's a very interesting question. Yeah, so in the, the end of the paper, we give a list of uh, uh, potential pairs, nu, nu and O, that make rigid connections. Not all of them are, not, not all such pairs uh, have uh, affirmative answer. So, so if, the, so if the answer is yes, then that pair will give rigid connection. And we have a, we have a list, so we we'll give an upper bound of the set of uh, rigid connections of that pattern. Uh, I just had a look at your, at your manuscript, uh, at your preprint. Uh -huh. uh, if I so correctly, you don't look at the rigid connections, you look at the cohomologically rigid connections. Oh, yeah, sorry, yes. And do you have, uh, do you have examples where uh, are there rigid connections which are not cohomologically rigid? Uh, I, I don't have any, uh, no, I haven't, uh, I have some uh, candidate example. <laughs> From this work, but um, but I'm not sure. So it's a candidate. I, I, I haven't proved that either way. It, from automorphic point of view, it produces more than one automorphic form. So I suspect it, it may be not physically rigid. But I don't know. That would be very nice to know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Can you say something general about? when there are solutions, what the space of solutions looks like. 
explicit solution. Ah, okay, for that, yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, yeah, these spaces are smooth and or I can compute its dimension. Um, uh, it fit into it's, it's, it's uh, it, it degenerates to this Hitchin modular space, which we there's a lot of structure in this space. For example, it has a, uh, for well chosen local conditions, we can make it into symplectic manifold and has a completely integrable system. Uh, I don't know too much about uh, much about the geometry here, except to say it's a smooth of dimension that you can compute. I think uh, the orders of like regular elliptic elements, they're also exactly like the uh, the orders of the like inner stable gratings on the uh -huh. yes. 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 I was wondering if uh, you know if there's any connection between your work and sort of the, uh, the, yeah. Uh, so so they I mean uh, right. So so just to give some context to this. Grading, if you have a cyclic grading on the algebra, you can, there's a notion of a stable uh, grading where the degree one part contains a regular semi simple uh, element in the algebra. And the classification of those stable gradings is essentially the same as uh, classification of regular elements uh, in the wild group. And if you, if you look at the proof why uh, these um, the, the slope, the possible slopes must have denominator equal to a uh, regular number, essentially we are kind of making this transition uh, between graded algebra and well elements. So yeah, it's kind of embedded in, in the argument. Mm -hmm. Can I ask? Uh, so uh, in the work of um, Katz, uh, he proves that uh, all rigid connections, uh, P1 has uh, a number of points, regular, singular, are coming from geometry. So now, of course, we cannot raise exactly the same question in your context, because we would have to, to say what coming from geometry means, because you have a regular singularity, singularities, but but nonetheless, one can say something. And uh, did you think in that direction with uh, you, you have a structure theorem uh, of this kind where everything comes from rank one and, uh, by some natural algebraic operations? Yeah, so, um, right, right, so in the classification rigid local system, uh, for GLN rigid local systems, we have using not just GLM, but all the, all the GL. Exactly. No. Uh, we don't have such structure for general G, yeah. but in this situation, I believe um, one can, if the, if the pair mu and O is rigid, then uh, one should be able to produce that rigid connection uh, starting from the automorphic input. Uh. Uh, so, Similar as my work with Heinlock involved, because uh, actually these spaces, although we should think of think of them as on the dual side of the Langlands correspondence, there is a similar space, uh, for example, this one uh, on the automorphic side. Uh, that's roughly speaking, uh, cotangent bundle to bond G with some level structure, mm -hmm. and in the rigid case that cotangent bundle just reduces to a point. Uh, and one should be able to write down an automorphic sheaf uh, and then apply HEPA operators to, uh, to get the irregular connection. Yes, yeah, thank you. And uh, some technical question that I'm reading now on here, this might be completely off track. When, uh, when you do your, uh, I forgot how you call it, it's a nilpotent orbit as a, Limit of a flow mm -hmm. is that related to the flow we have oh, on the exactly. left side? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yes. So it's a it's a Simpson construction. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's time to speak again.